Good morning, River Oaks. So good to see you here. And those of you online, we're glad to have you with us on this Memorial Day weekend. If you are a veteran, if you've served time in the military or you are in the military, we just want to say thank you for that. Uh, we're here this morning because we have freedoms because of the price that you paid for those freedoms, and we're grateful. And uh, this weekend, sometimes it's easy just to think, well, we have a day off, and we forget why. And uh, so we just don't want to skip over that without acknowledging the, the significant price that was paid. So if uh, you're looking for a program, obviously we couldn't hand you one because of we're trying to be safe, but you can pull it up online. You should have gotten an email and you have an electronic program that you can look at if you would like to do so. So please feel free to do that. We won't judge you for looking at your phone as long as it's not Facebook during this time. So <laughs> if you would, please, let's uh, bow our heads. Let's prepare our hearts for worship. Father God, we are so grateful for who you are. We're grateful for the beauty of today. We're grateful for the opportunity to come together as a body of believers, whether online or here in person, that we can celebrate you, we can recognize you, we can put you first and foremost in our lives and recognize uh, the significance of that. Father, uh, during our time here today, may everything we say, everything we hear, the songs that we sing bring glory and honor to you and to you alone. We give you this time, and we're grateful for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we sing. Welcome back. This is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't complain. For all my hope is in your name Now your joy awaits my praise I give thanks for all you have done I will sing of your mercy and your love Your love is unfailing Lord, I am grateful Faithfulness, my solid rock. I give thanks for all you have done, and I will sing of your mercy and your love. Your love is unfailing, Lord. I am grateful. I give thanks for all you have done. I won't forget all the
been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. so kind and we have so much to be thankful for but today we're especially thankful for being able to start coming back here to church and we're thankful that your word Lord says that where two or more of us are gathered you are there with us and the church is not a place it's your people so as we've been off at home and some of us are, are still there it's good to know you're with us and that we're still the church 
and that the gates of hell still will not prevail against it. You're a good father and you're always watching out for us, taking care of us. And I just want to say a special thanks for that right now. Father, just pray that you continue to help us as we transition back to normal and get on with the work of the church as a group. But just help us, Father, to look for those opportunities to be the church every day, no matter where we are, no matter how many of us are gathered. We praise you and thank you in the name of Jesus who takes away all our sin. Amen. It's so good to see people. I, uh, I have, I've gotten a little sick of only staring at a camera for the last 10 weeks. And so it is so, it was almost like, and admittedly, there weren't a lot of people in, in, at the 8 o'clock service, but it was awesome. It was great uh, to have them here. And then uh, 9.30, and now you guys are here. Because, man, I've missed you guys. I've missed seeing you guys sleep through my preaching. I've missed, I've missed watching you guys think that you're inconspicuously like picking your nose and no one can see you. And yes, I can see you. I, we tell people sometimes, you can't see anything because of the lights. We see everything, <laughs> including when you're digging for gold. So uh, man, excited to have people in the room with us. Excited to have uh, just as many, if not more, people online still on the other side of the camera lens. We're so glad that you guys have joined us. 
uh, here at River Oaks and our team's continuing to work hard to make sure that uh, you're feeling connected with and in- included. And one of the best things that you can actually do if you're online right now is to go below the video and hit the subscribe button because our account is actually going to kind of get upgraded once we have enough people subscribe to it, which is going to make your experience at home way better. So do yourself a favor and subscribe right below where you're watching online right now. And it's actually going to end up being a lot better time for everyone. But regardless if you're online, regardless if you're in the room, can we just stop for a moment and just give it up for God that we are here, we have made it, we are going to make it, and uh, man, I'm excited to be here. We are creatures of habit, aren't we? We, we love our rhythm, we love uh, just kind of the expected in some way. And so it's good to start to get back to that rhythm that so many of us have been missing. But I hope, and it's my prayer, that we don't just go back to the way things were. Because there were parts of our rhythm, there was a part of our pace pre-COVID uh, that, that was not healthy. Because there were a lot of us, I know there were a lot of us that were working and, and moving at a pace that was not healthy. We, our rhythm was not sustainable. And, and my prayer is that we don't just immediately go back to that pace where we felt trapped by our own calendar. And instead, we take this opportunity, that this, this giant pause, and as we reestablish our rhythms, as, as Little League comes back, as summer activities start to kick back into gear, as our options begin to return, we just don't go back to the way things were. But instead, we establish a new rhythm. We establish a new pace that honors God and prioritizes our family. Because we've experienced here at River Oaks that this, this pause, this moment, this reset has, has done a couple things for our families. For some families, it's been awesome. It has been so good to be able to just set more time aside to just connect and to be together, spend more time together. For some of our families, this pause has taken what were cracks in the foundations of our families and, and turned into full-blown failure. So some of us, we've enjoyed it, and some of us are now looking for a really good counselor. And that's okay. But this is, this is what actually Peter is going to talk about today as we continue on our series, Stand From. He's going to speak to our families. And specifically, he's going to talk to husbands, and he's going to talk to wives. Now, if you're a student, if you're single, this doesn't mean you get to tune out. At this point, you don't close out of your browser window that you're watching on. If you're a student or single, because here's what I know. I know far too many people, far too many people spend a lot of time planning to get married and not nearly enough people spend enough time planning to stay married. We spend a lot of time planning for the moment that we say, I do, and we don't spend nearly enough time planning for how to actually walk out those I do's. And so if you're single and you would like to get married someday, if you're a student, lean in. Lean into this moment. Ladies, when you dream about your wedding day, I promise you that that. As much as you dream about that, three, five, seven, 15, 25 years after you say I do, you're going to wish that you spent just as much time planning to get married. So if you're a student, if you're single, if you'd like to be married someday, lean in because I promise you one thing. I promise you one thing that you're going to take into your marriage relationship. And that's you. You're going to take yourself. And there is no magical switch that you throw in the moment that you say, I do, that turns you into the man or the woman, the husband or wife that God is calling you to be. So lean in today. Begin now to become the person by the power of the Holy Spirit that God is calling you to be in your marriage relationship. So lean in. And even if, even if you're a widow, if, if you have no intent of ever getting married, I encourage you, lean in because there's going to be some good stuff, I think, for, that Peter is going to instruct us in in the context of a marriage relationship that's going to be good for us as well. So here's where he starts, 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 1, and he starts, in the same way, in the same way, like last week, as we submit to earthly authority, for the Lord's sake, 
In the same way, for the Lord's sake, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands for the Lord's sake. Now, let me <clears throat> demonstrate what this means. I need our newlyweds to join me. The riding hours, they're going to come on up. Okay. Micah, go that direction. Annette, go that direction. Just pick up the rope, not the coil. Just the rope. Oh, you want to switch? Oh, you're actually going to play. Wow. Okay, here we go. Wow. So first service, uh, our married couple had been married for about 30 years. Last service, it was 10. This service was two weeks. And these folks are way more dedicated to this right now, right? So when we hear... When we hear the word, wives submit to your husbands, this is what we think of, right? We're about to play some tug of war, right? And the whole purpose of tug of war is to use, what is going on over here? The whole purpose, okay. The whole purpose of tug of war, you are not going to win. The whole purpose of tug of war is to what? Use your brute strength to try and drag the person in the direction you want to go. And oftentimes when we hear the word submit in a marriage relationship, this is what we think of. Which if this is what we think of, I'm not surprised because in Genesis chapter 3 verse 16, <laughs> in Genesis chapter 3 verse 16, after the fall, God actually looks at Eve and he says, because of sin, you are going to have a desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And so in that moment, submission becomes a dirty word. Because of sin, submission becomes a dirty word. When true submission, it's not, it's not being forced to do anything. True submission is actually willingly placing yourself under the authority of someone else. If you're not willingly doing it, it's not submission, it's subjugation. And so true submission is actually, in that you letting go of the rope and going over to Micah's side, and instead of pulling against each other, you pull, <laughs> don't break the Nord. Instead of pulling against each other, you pull together in the same direction for the same common purpose, for this, towards the same goals, and the same common purpose. Ends. Thank you, guys. That was <laughs> exciting. This is what submission is, right? It's not tug of war. Instead, it's making the choice to willingly pull in the same direction. Scott Allen, our worship director, I played trumpet for like seven or eight years, middle school, high school, that kind of stuff. He would tell you, Scott Allen would tell you, that the number one like team sport, team activity is band or orchestra. Because it takes so many parts and pieces, so many different people all understanding their role, all understanding how everything has been orchestrated together in order to produce a musical masterpiece. Because the melody is not the melody without the harmony, without the bass line. And get this, all it takes is one person in a 100-piece orchestra to ruin the whole thing. It takes one person to go rogue and to, to blow the entire performance up. And so this, this is what Peter is trying to get us to understand that God has orchestrated this marriage relationship in such a way from the very beginning of time that he's telling us how do these two pieces that we call man and wife, how do they live in unity together in one flesh in the way that God has designed it to be? He, he says there's actually a design that's so woven into the very fabric of our being that when it's lived out correctly, it points to the gospel. It draws people's hearts to Christ because he continues in verse 1. He says, then, ladies, wives, even if some, even if you have a husband who's not a believer, ladies, even if some of your husbands refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. And they will be won over by observing your pure and reverent 
lives. See, in, in Peter's audience, he understood that in his audience, he had women who had converted to Christianity before their husbands. Because in Rome, Christianity is, is pro-woman. It's wildly popular with women, especially poor women, because no one else was giving women, were giving women value, dignity, honor, and Christianity takes these women and props them up. And so uh, compared to the cult worship of the day, women loved Christianity and the value and the dignity it gave them. And so he's talking to these women whose, whose husbands have not yet converted to the faith, and he's saying, your lives, by how you give your husband respect, can actually draw their heart to the gospel. It can actually draw their heart to the gospel. You can win your unbelieving husbands without ever using words, without being quarrelsome, without trying to put them in their place, without trying to one-up them. You can actually live this careful living, this lifestyle evangelism out by simply how you respect your husbands. Because psychologists affirm that for most men, one of their deepest held needs is a need to be respected. It's a need to be respected. And so even if your husband doesn't, even if your husband doesn't deserve your respect, for the Lord's sake, Peter is saying, Submit to your husbands. Give him respect because in giving him that respect, when men have a woman in their life that prop them up, that speak words of life to them, that, that respect them, it actually draws their heart towards the gospel. And so he says, ladies, respect your husband. And so he moves into kind of this perception of what is beauty. What does it mean to be beautiful in verse 3? He says, don't be concerned, ladies, about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles or expensive jewelry or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. So he starts with this timeless truth that you've been told, I hope you know, I hope you believe that true beauty is found in the heart of a woman. True beauty actually resides within the heart of a woman because their culture wasn't too dissimilar from ours. The way they identified beauty was kind of this external, uh, outward expression. It was how your hair was done. It was the designer shoes on your feet. It was, it was the jewelry that you wore. It was the handbag that you had thrown over your shoulder. This is how they defined beauty. And Peter is saying, be more concerned about the inward beauty because that's where true beauty is found. It's not an outward expression, it's an inward quality. And it starts with gentleness of spirit. It starts with this, this idea of gentleness of spirit. And when you hear gentleness, don't think weakness. Because this word, this Greek word, is only used three other times in the entire New Testament. All three times it's used by Jesus, and two out of the three times he uses it, he's describing himself. And no one's ever called Jesus weak. So he, what Peter is saying is it starts with the same spirit that Jesus had. That's where true beauty begins. So ladies... I want you to know that there's no shame in your game if you like to wear sweatpants, oversized hoodies, and a messy bun every single day as long as you're living like Jesus because that is where true beauty is found because outward beauty fades, wrinkles come, but inward beauty, it endures, and even oftentimes inward beauty, it grows with age. Which is hard for us to grasp in a culture, in a society that often defines beauty with Photoshop and airbrushes, with, with reality television that follow housewives around and all we see is drama and dissension and what we're telling our young girls is this is what it looks like to be a strong and beautiful woman. And Peter's saying, don't be like that. 
He says instead, instead of being like that, be like Sarah, the wife of Father Abraham, the mother of the entire Hebrew nation who decided she was going to follow her husband on the adventure of a lifetime with nothing but the promise that God was going to bless the entire world through her and Abraham's family. Be like that. Don't be a desperate housewife. Be like that because that is where true beauty is found. That is what beauty looks like. And so Peter, he shifts now to the guys. He shifts gears and he starts to talk to the men. And admittedly, he uses a lot less words for the men. Not because they need less instruction, but simply because if he could have grunted and got his point across, he probably would have done it. Instead, he expands his thoughts to one verse. In verse 7, he says, In the same way, for the Lord's sake, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, But she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. So he uses less words, but he doesn't let guys off the hook. He just, he's short to the point, but still punchy. He says, honor your wives. Give your wives honor and live with her with understanding. I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, but men and women are actually quite different. And so what he's saying, what Peter is saying to these men, he says, your role, your responsibility is to work as hard as you can to understand your wife. You don't have to figure out what all women want. You just got to figure out what the one woman that lives in your house who's your wife wants. So figure out what makes her tick and do those things. Figure out what makes her ticked and don't do those things. (laughs) Says figure out How does she show affection? How does she receive affection? What is her love language? And then become fluent in speaking that language. Work hard to understand your wife and to show her honor. And he says, I know she's the weaker vessel is this language he uses. And what he's saying is, I know in this culture, she she doesn't have as many political rights as you. I know she doesn't, in society, she's not as highly thought of. I know in your home that that you're in a position of leadership over her. I know that 10 times out of 10 times, you're going to beat her in a game of tug of war. But just because you can doesn't mean you should. You give her honor. You live with her with understanding because she is your equal in the kingdom of God. Your roles may be different, but she is your equal in the kingdom of God. She has the same access to the same promises, has the same standing before a God who shows no favorites. So treat her with the honor that she deserves. And Peter, he takes this so seriously. God takes this so seriously that he says, if you don't treat your wife the way that you should, there are consequences he says, he says, if you don't give your wife the attention that she deserves, the way that she deserves it, when you go to God seeking his attention in prayer, all you're going to get back is la, 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 la. He says your prayers will be hindered. So if it feels like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling, you better go talk to your wife. If this communication's not going well, then you better go check this communication. Because that's probably the problem. Or at least part of it. So the role of the wife is to submit to her husband. But the role of the husband is not to submit, but it's to die. It's not submission, it's death. It's to put to death yourself. It's to die to self. It's to die to your own desires. And instead, put the desires and the needs of your family, of your wife, ahead of your home. Being head of household, it doesn't mean that everyone in your house serves you. It means that you get to serve everybody in your house. Your position isn't for your benefit. Your position is to meet the needs of your wife. Your position is in order to bring her honor. Just like Christ, 
We're called to emulate Christ who referred to himself as the bridegroom of the church, you and I. And Jesus, he lays himself down for us. This is what Paul says in in Ephesians 5.25. He says, husbands, this means that you love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave up his life for her. And yet too many times men use their authority for their own benefit. They use their position for their own benefit. They use their leadership to meet their own needs, to serve themselves. And that's not the call. So the design is that men lead and love their wives in such a way that wives joyfully and enjoyably and willfully submit to their husbands. They're happy to do it because of how well they're loved. And at the same time, wives submit to their husbands in such a way that their husband, he loves laying his life down for her. He loves sacrificing himself for her because of how well she follows his authority. And it just creates this cycle of sacrifice and submission, of loving and respecting, so it just starts to feed off of itself. It's like a never-ending circle, like Mufasa's circle of life. It just, it's, the, it's, it's the ecosystem of the family. It's how everything is held together. When we love and respect, sacrifice, and submit. But it starts with the man. It starts with the man. It always has to start with the man because it's always the leader's job to set the tone. It's the leader's job to initiate the action. It's the leader's job to bring clarity to the situation. And yet, men, we're often guilty of being a little too passive. Of being a little apathetic at times. Of being a little too physically or emotionally distant. And maybe you've experienced this, but often our wives are better at perceiving kind of the needs within our families, within our relationships than we are. And what happens is that where there's a void in leadership, our wife is more than happy to fill that need because it needs to be done. Which is fine and great and dandy until she leads in a direction you don't want to go. And then here we come swooping back in with, you know, they're subverting our our authority in the house. and, And suddenly all we do is we pick up the rope and we're back in this game of tug of war until we use our position, we use our authority, and we pull and we pull and we pull until our wife is at the end of their rope and I get an email from her, an SOS that says, Something's got to change because I'm about done. And it's usually about the time that that happens that there, it's hard to bounce back because there's been a lot of damage been done. And it's a, as a pastor, it's like showing up at a car wreck where a car has been T-boned in an intersection at a high rate of speed and there's just debris and there's glass everywhere and you find someone sitting on a curb on the side of the road and they look at you and go, can you fix it? But uh, the the problem is if if the email or the phone call would have come three or six months earlier, the the whole problem would have been averted because marriages don't wreck in a moment like a car does. It can be prevented. So let me encourage you, if you find cracks in your relationship, do something today. Commit today to begin to fix it. Commit today to begin to fix it. Have a conversation in the car on the way home, on the couch right now, over lunch, where, whatever it is. Have a conversation to check in. Send one of our members of our pastoral team an email saying, hey, we need some help because we don't know what we're doing. Take a step to begin to fix the cracks before full-blown failure happens. And men, you do it. 
Men, you lead. Men, you initiate the conversation. You send the email. Men, you lead. Do not make your wife drag you through this. And ladies, give him till Saturday. Almost a whole week. He might need to work up some courage or something. Give him till Saturday. Even if you think your marriage is stellar. Give him till Saturday to just check in. How are we doing? What's going on? And if by Saturday he hasn't, then you have my permission to respectfully approach your husband and say, hey, we need to talk. And by the way, I wish you would have led. I wish you would have done this. And that made me do it. Man, you better. Otherwise, you have an awkward situation on your hands this week. It's so important because there is a blessing. There is a blessing to be found when we follow God's blueprint for our marriages. Because if there wasn't, he wouldn't give us this instruction. If, if this wasn't going to bless our relationships, he wouldn't give us this instruction. And I know, I know that there are voices out there, there are people that are saying, well, this is so archaic. This is so old school. This, this just, it, it hinders progress. It puts people in boxes. But I hope we don't miss that in the moment that it feels like more than ever, we're trying to redefine marriage, that we're trying to redefine the roles in marriage is also the moment where divorce rates in the United States, inside or outside the church, are 50, 60%. That cohabitation is, is the new fad. That we like to pretend we're married by living together, but we don't actually commit to one another. This isn't meant to hurt you. It's actually meant to help you. Because there's a blessing when you follow the plan. When you follow the plan that God has ordained and orchestrated from the very beginning of time, there's a blessing for your relationship. There's a blessing for your family. Generational curses can be broken. If one man and one woman say, you know what, enough is enough, enough with the dysfunction, and we are going to choose by the power of the Holy Spirit to live out what God has ordained for our marriage. We are going to stand firm and what God calls us to as husband and wife, and watch how God blesses your home. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for this instruction. We thank you that, that you've given us this wisdom And we know it's so important to you because it's the marriage relationship that you use to describe your relationship with us. It's a bridegroom in the church. You laid your life down for us. You sacrificed yourself for us willingly and joyfully. And we're called to submit to your leadership in our lives. It's a picture of marriage. Father, we pray for our husbands that they would initiate, that they would lead, they would bring clarity. They would take action. They would refuse to be passive. And they would lead their families. They would lead in their homes, in their marriages. We pray for our wives that you would give them patience for their husbands when they don't do what they're supposed to do. That you would help them to Submit to their husband's authority. That you would help them to remember that their beauty is found within. We pray for our singles. We pray for our students. That by the power of your Holy Spirit, even now, they would begin to become the men and the women, the husbands and wives that you are calling them to be. For the benefit of their families, for the glory of the kingdom of God. Pray for our families, knowing that they are the bedrock of our community. And when our families are healthy, our community will be healthy. So we pray, Father, by the power of your spirit, you would move, you would work in our hearts and our minds. Pray this in Jesus' name. We love you. Amen.
be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.
Amen. So be it. Well, I hope you know uh, that I'm serious when I want you to know that River Oaks, uh, we want to be a refuge for the marriages uh, in our church family, um, in our community. And so if you're needing any assistance as, as you reflect this week and you go, man, we need a little bit of help, please reach out. There are all kinds of resources uh, to help you. And men, lead, 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 lead. Uh, do what your family needs. Uh, to, to be healthy, to thrive, to move forward, to live according to the plan God has for you. So reach out to our pastoral team. You can email us uh, directly. Email us at support at riveroaks.org. Let us, let us help or at least point you towards uh, some resources. Well, I want to say thank you for joining us in, perp- in, in person, on purpose, in person. You're here on purpose. Uh, thanks for joining us online. Uh, do need to know that every week through this kind of this goofy season, we are going to ask you to re-reserve your seat for each week. So as plans change, so, uh, so the same process that you did this week to get here, uh, it is open, it's live. You can go right now to riveroaks.org and reserve your seat. If you're online and you think next week is the week for you to join us, uh, go to riveroaks.org, you can reserve your seat. For those of us that are in the room, uh, as we leave, we're going to split like the Red Sea, go to the outside, and go out the back single doors. Uh, for the sake of just not running into each other, it may be a good idea to kind of go from the back to the front, but we'll let you guys kind of manage that on your own. I'm sure you can figure it out. So thanks so much for being here. It's so good to see your faces. We'll see you guys next week here at River Oaks.